with Johnny Breath, who you may know better as Deacon from What We Do in the Shadows. First of all, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes to sit down with me. It really means a lot. It's a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I saw that What We Do in the Shadows was actually mostly improv, and I love movies and shows that are sort of created that way. Can you tell me a little more about the process? Yes, yeah, so, so when we shot it, it was, there was a lot of improv, but we still had to write a script. Well, the, the Tyker and Jermaine had to write a script to show the people who paid for it and show the, the uh, art department who build the sets and make the costumes because they need to know what's going to happen. So, um, and then they filled all the scenes with jokes so that you, know, you can impress everybody so they want to do the film and they, someone will want to pay for the film. And uh, then when we're finally shooting it, um, they just keep the script away from the actors. Huh. So in a scene, all I would get would be, um, in this scene, Johnny, we're just gonna talk about how, how nice uh, Stu is. Mm. So, um, sh well, should we sit on the couch? Yeah, let's sit on the couch. So we'd all sit down and I'd sit in the middle. And um, often the other two boys would just sit silently and wait for someone else to speak. So there'd be lots of um, really cute, funny silences. We would just sort of sit there and not know what to do. And I would wait for them because I had no idea, you know, what was what ideas they had. I thought maybe they're going to play tricks on me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Some actors do that, and um, yeah. So I so I think the reason why they did that was to was to get um, a sense of nothing or a sense of lostness, you know. So uh, yeah. so usually actors like to know what they're doing, mm -hmm. and often then they'll just go for it and but there often there isn't the fragility in that or there isn't um, any, you know, maybe it's a, we have the, we call, we call ourselves Kiwis in New Zealand, that's our nickname, so we call it, I would call it a Kiwiism to um, sit there and not say much because Kiwis don't really, Kiwi men don't really talk as much as, you know, Americans are good at talking, Kiwi men aren't quite so good at talking. So, you know, that's what we'd do really and then, uh, do you remember the scene where I did the erotic dance? Yes. So on the morning of that, we, all we knew, all I knew was that Nick was gonna float around outside the window and um, we were gonna be sitting watching TV and then we'll be annoyed by him. But um, Jermaine would say, have you got any good gags, anything else we can do that might be better? Mm -hmm. And I thought, why don't you just make it up? Why don't you just like, you know, but, I thought, well, it's also a good opportunity to be playful, which is the whole point of the loose nature yeah. of it. And so we, I thought, well, Deacon likes, Deacon likes to um, do erotic dance, so maybe I'll do an erotic dance. Ooh. And I expected everyone to go, hmm, maybe. Instead, he just would, he laughed and then t told Tyker, and Tyker laughed, and off we went to find some uh, snake charming music and. Then I humiliated myself for half an hour trying to be erotic in front of the cameras. It was amazing. Which is very difficult. Oh no, it was amazing though. Oh good. So good. Um, but yeah, the comedy in that movie is fantastic and knowing that it all comes from improv is amazing. Uh, I actually had did a project really recently which was a bunch of kids, uh, for a group of 14, where we all improv and then that script was turned into a script for a movie and we're uh, getting that funded right now. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great way to make stories. Yeah, especially because it came from all the kids and so yeah. it's awesome. I, it's, I'm super excited about that coming out. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it very much. No, I, I understand. Yeah, I just, I love improv and I love how natural it can be because you can sort of tell when a joke is very, like this was written in the script and the actor is saying it because it was in the script. Yeah. But improv makes it like this is something the actor thought the character would say. Yeah, and there's more honesty, I think, and more, and um, yeah, and more truth. Yeah, I, I loved it so much. Um, and like speaking of comedy, I saw an interview where you sort of talked about stand-up comedy and how it's just sort of talking about ideas rather than making it into a sketch or a show. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder what you think about stand-up versus improv based on like having an idea and talking about it versus scripting out an idea. Well, I think stand-up comedians definitely script out their ideas. And often, some of the stand-up comedians that I know will maybe if they, let's say they did two gigs in a night, they would do one at seven and then go do one at 10 or one at midnight. In the taxi on the way there, they would be running through their ideas in their head. So there's, you know, there's always, 
you always try to um, keep the script in your head for those gags and often someone will have a better gag and tell you about it and you'll add that right in and there's some then you've got more material in terms of improv um, there are different kinds I mean have you ever done theater sports um maybe you know, theater sports where you have to tell a story where the audience gives you two little things that give you a, yeah, like yeah, an yeah. animal or a, a name and you've got to t tell a whole story yeah and you've got to start and middle and end the the thing and you can't you can't stop improvising until you finish the story which is the whole hilarity of it you know yeah so but that's more about working really hard and being right on the knife edge of being an, um, an improviser I guess so um, with well I, with stand-up comedy you know I'll, I'll tell you about something that that irks me you know something about where people don't indicate properly or something like that and then I'll play out the scene and you know people appreciate it and understand it um, I think those kind of you know that kind of satire is um, just talking with the audience including the audience and with the stories yeah. with um, improv you're just going for laughs and my kind of improv right which is more like character improv with yeah. Deacon the vampire as a character um, it's even it's even easier because Deacon doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to be funny. He doesn't have to be clever. In fact, the the, the more of a, an idiot he is, the better. Yeah. Um, and I liked I liked playing with being impatient and thinking he's pretty tough, but also being a bit sensitive. Yeah. And so that's cute. I thought that was cute and and um, charming. Yeah, it's and always. I, I like to think that it worked. Yeah, it's like, like all of those. That kind of character is always like my favorite. When you're, they're like trying to be tough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not so much. Uh, my favorite, like metaphor for it is like a giant mech with all sorts of weapons with a tiny bunny driving it. Yeah, I love that. I love that kind That's of character. Cute. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I think about uh, comedy, and one thing that I think is really interesting, is how it works in different cultures and languages. And um, you are like from New Zealand, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how comedy has changed doing it here versus doing it over in New Zealand and in other places. Well, that's a really tough question, but uh, and it's taken me many years to try to understand it because I've often, often thought about that myself, and I think I've come to with this conclusion that maybe American comedy and British comedy are uh, quite different and I've got a couple of good examples and I think Kiwis are a bit closer to British comedy because um, like America we broke away from England and to resist this, the class system where there was the rich and they didn't like hanging out with the working class or the, the lower class and so we you know Kiwis rejected that and you know Americans uh, the English Americans rejected that too and um, I think New Zealand comedy also likes to be self-deprecating. We like to we don't like to be too much above ourselves. We call it the tall poppy syndrome. Kiwis have this thing we call it. We like to chop the head off the tall poppy because they're getting above themselves. And um, there's also natural humility in um, in the Pacific Island cultures too. There's a lot of Pacific Islanders living in New Zealand, and there's a real cultural humility there which rubs off on Kiwis and same in America but in a different way UK comedy British comedy is more about humiliation or embarrassment because we like to punch up at the rich bastard the asshole we like yeah. to punch up at the person who doesn't who's too big for their boots um, and I think American comedy is a little bit more um, like parody where okay a good example would be um, Scrubs did you see Scrubs? I don't think so probably not I haven't seen enough things. Well Scrubs is a, about some young um, nurses working in a hospital and it's they they just <clears throat> trying to get along and the, the sense of comedy in there is the pace of the comedy is a lot of it is about saying things sarcastically yeah. and so it's kind of parody is um, pretending I guess and that's the sense of comedy I may have this I may be this might be really simplistic because I still don't quite understand it but British comedy is about 
um, being embarrassed. Um, there's a show called The Office. Have you ever seen The Office? I've seen a little bit, yes. So the British one was so hard to watch because the lead actor just humiliated himself all the time. And uh, that, that's what made it funny and really, that's what made it so edgy and hard to watch because it was so, he's, he just embarrasses himself. And um, do Americans do that in comedy? Um, sometimes, like, we don't do it as much. I personally don't watch a lot of humiliation comedy because I get a lot of secondhand embarrassment from people. And so that yeah, can make me hard, eh? Yeah. But we do, there's definitely so much sarcasm in uh, American humor. There's a lot of sarcasm, a lot of like making weird, like everyday things funny by just blowing them out of proportion. Like we blow everything out of proportion. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really interesting, like cultural differences in comedy, especially because different things are so funny to people in other countries that aren't funny to people to us here and vice versa it's just weird that there isn't one sense of what is funny and every culture has a different one i think it's awesome well yeah i mean i'd love i'd love to be able to come and do comedy in america and for everyone to understand it and for me to understand what the audience wants yeah. But it's quite intimidating as a Kiwi to come over and, and think that I can be funny for an American audience. Mm -hmm. Because, um, and I love American stand-up, like American stand-up is, you know, Louis C.K. and um, yeah, America's really good at stand-up and being truthful and honest and getting to the, right to the guts of what grinds our gears, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, like speaking of New Zealand and stuff there. We're actually planning to go to New Zealand for the first time next year. And I was wondering if you have any tips on some places to go that aren't super like touristy? Hmm. Well, I think the, I think you should go to Wellington and if you are you going to drive a car? Um, are you going with your family? Yeah, I'm going with my family. So, um, any of your parents good drivers? Um, well, I mean, both my parents can drive. Um, I don't have too much of a sense on what's a good driver and what isn't, because I don't drive, but both of them can drive. We would probably mostly take Ubers. If, do you have Ubers? Yeah, we yeah. do, but they're a bit more expensive in New Zealand. Uh, in fact, if you went to the South Island, there probably wouldn't be any Ubers, they'd just be taxis. Oh. But I think if, like if you, if I'd go to Auckland and hang around Auckland, because there's so many great beaches, because the land mass, the land mass goes in into this narrow stretch of land, which is Auckland, and so just beaches everywhere, you know? Oh, that's amazing. You can't go anywhere without seeing a beach, and, it, and it's great. Oh, that's so cool. And, and, and definitely go in summer. Yeah. And if you can, grab a car or um, jump on a train and head in, down to the South Island because the, sub, because the landscape's beautiful. I also watched, like, the first, I could only find, like, the first 11 minutes of uh, Everest Untold, and it was awesome. Oh, well, the play? Yeah, it seems so interesting because I, do have an interest in like ever in Mount Everest and the people that yeah, went up me there, too. and it was awesome. It's like it's such a clever thing that um, you're doing like the slideshow presentation. I love what you said, where people like sit down and for the first ten minutes they're like, "Did I sign up for like an hour? Is this it?" Yeah. But it was awesome and it was, it was like super funny just the way that you do it and how casually you did like the first ten or so minutes. Yeah. It was awesome. So I just wanted to just, like tell you that it was super cool. Well, I could. Shall I tell you some things about it? Yes, please do. Well, the play was set. Um, the guy who wrote it is a is a merchant banker reformer. So he's he's worth a lot of money. He decided he just wanted to start writing plays. So he employed um, some some storytellers in New Zealand to help him make his play, which meant cutting down this enormous script down to the the right size script because he wanted to say things over and over again. But um, he researched the uh, the British expedition to Everest, and my friend Stephen Lovett and I workshopped it and made it. And it's just set in a, cl a climbing club yeah. in the middle of New Zealand uh, where we talk about our experiences. And the real character that I play is about twice my height. Ooh, wow, yeah. yeah. I, I can experience that. I'm very short, like even short for my age. It's too short, but it, it was a really cool um, thing. And I was wondering if you could watch, like just see and know what happened in any event in history, what would it be? Wow, good question. I've often thought that I would like to go back to pre-European New Zealand, but I don't think I'd last. Well, yeah, if you could just like watch it, like 
if you oh, were yeah. in this like safe bubble and you could see what happened. And then probably pre-European America. Yeah, um, you talk like you've talked a lot about how fascinating that time is to you. Um, and I was wondering if you've ever read uh, 1491. I've got that book at home. Really? Is it the Chinese? Is it the the book about China or the Chinese? A martyr, no, or is it a different one? Uh, 1491, it's about pre-colonial America. Oh, okay. It's yeah. uh, really fascinating. I just got it. I haven't read all of it so far. But it's really fascinating just sort of how much, like as an American, I don't know this stuff. And it's amazing to learn about what America was like pre-settlement. like settlement. Yeah, it's yeah, it, yeah. But I just think I, it's like wanting to know something that, that something new about the world that I haven't experienced that I that would be that would teach me about now I guess yeah like you have to know history because history repeats itself if you don't study it yeah that's and right it's I, I definitely like pride myself in knowing a lot of history and I think it's amazing that you know a lot of history and that you're interested in learning it because there are so many people that don't want to and I find that so weird that people don't know and don't want to know history? Well, I didn't know much when I was younger. When I was a teenager, I didn't, I never thought about it. And um, as, because when I'm acting, it means that I get lots of time without much work on, so I like reading. When you're on set, you can sit all day and read before you do one scene, but you have to be there all day. So I love reading. And I mean, I have to admit, a lot of the reading that I do about, about history is actually fiction. And um, fictional, anthropologists or uh, anthropological writers or archaeological writers or historical writers I particularly enjoy Gary Jennings is a is some, one that uh, you might like I'll be sure to check um, it out that seems awesome yeah he's written so many books about um, Dark Age England and um, uh, America um, and Europe parts of Europe and, and China his books are amazing. Yeah, thank you for the recommendation. I love history and I love historical fiction. In fact, my favorite book is called Aztec by Gary Jennings about about the Aztecs in Mexico. Oh, that's awesome. And it's fiction and it's a huge, it's a huge saga. And at the end of it, I cried, right. cried my eyes out. Oh, that's amazing. It broke my heart. We don't know enough about like Aztec society. It's so weird. Um, but yeah, the history is just, it's super awesome. And I love that you learn a lot about it. Um, and that you have such amazing interactions with people um, over history and over learning history. And I was just sort of yeah. wondering, like, what is your favorite interaction you've had with someone over history? Well, probably um, I took a play to the Edinburgh uh, Fringe Festival, which is in Scotland, the capital of Scotland. Is it the capital or is Glasgow? Does anyone know that? Oh, no, right. Um, <laughs> well, I should know that. <laughs> maybe. I think it's Edinburgh, uh, which is where there's a big castle and it's amazing. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> we drove out into the country after our show and uh, went to a place called Culloden, which is where there was a huge battle where the Scots were killed by the English in a revenge attack. And um, just really loved this one man who just walked us around this landscape where thousands of Scottish were killed and they're showing us these pits. And I, you know, there was, it was amazing because I had a real thing for Scotland because I actually thought I was Scottish. <laughs> it was not until I did that um, DNA Detectives show that I discovered I, that my last name was Dutch and not Scottish. So interesting. Thank you so much again for sitting down with me. It was super awesome. It if, was, thank you. Yay. Uh, 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 uh,